Psalms. Now, you guys know as well as I do that Psalms are music. They're poetry. So essentially, it's Christmas music. Right? It's ancient Christmas music. Some of you are thrilled by that. And uh, I'll give you this. It's, I'm going to have a little fun with this. All three of the Psalms we'll be looking at the next couple of weeks, or the next few weeks, will be in the 80s, Psalm 80, 80, 85. So this is also not just Christmas music, it's 80s Christmas music. Yeah, I know. That was, that was bad. Sorry. Laugh anyway. I appreciate that. So uh, <laughs> we are going to be in, in Psalm 80 this morning. Now, um, I'm sure you've already caught it on the radio. You probably are listening to it. You're perhaps already hearing Christmas music. If you've been out in public, you've already heard Christmas music, right? It's a Walmart. If you go to Hobby Lobby, it was on there two months ago. Um, so you and uh, and I, I have to admit, there are Christmas songs I like, but there are also Christmas songs that are annoying, aren't there? You know, I, I, I had a little fun this week. I, I googled most annoying Christmas songs. Now, I, I recognize that this is a fairly subjective category, but I looked at a lot of different lists, and there were a handful of songs that seemed to be on everyone's list. So you may know some of these, you may not. Um, I did not know a couple of them, but there's a, uh, you, you may have heard this, and there's a, there's a song that Paul McCartney did called Wonderful Christmas. This is a 70s era Christmas song, and it's awful. Uh, some of you may know, you know, Paul McCartney did lots of great songs, but boy, this is not one of them. Um, another one that was on a lot of people's list is the Chipmunks Christmas song. <laughs> I thought about trying to impersonate the Chipmunks this morning, and no. <laughs> uh, two more that were on this list, almost everyone's list. Grandma got run over by a reindeer. <laughs> and all that I want for Christmas is... My two front teeth. Yeah, that, that's, that's on there as well. You may have your own personal most annoying ones. I, I, by the way, I came across one more I had never heard of before. This is from 1953. So some of you may remember this when it came out. It's called, I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas. You, you guys know this? I have never heard that one. And I listened to it and went, I could have gone a lot longer without hearing it. Um, <laughs> I, I had to throw in a couple of my own personal annoying songs. Uh, one is Feliz Navidad. That just gets in my ear and won't go away. And then uh, one that was on a lot of lists was Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. I get the sentiment, but, you know, please just stop. Um, <laughs> so there are all kinds of Christmas songs. There are songs about snow and just being cold there are songs about shopping and santa claus and there's even though as we mentioned before there's even one about a song there's even a song about death by reindeer um some songs even imagine this talk about jesus's birth or the conditions perhaps around his birth the psalms talk about what we need god to do and how he's going to do it and how he has done it who jesus is these are the songs we'll be looking at over these next few weeks psalm 80 we've already read the first three verses but we'll read those again this morning oh give ear shepherd of israel you who lead joseph like a flock you who are enthroned above the cherubim shine forth before ephraim and benjamin and manasseh stir up your power and come to save us oh god restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved oh lord god of hosts how long will you be angry with the prayers of your people you have fed them with the bread of tears, and you have made them to drink tears in large measure. You make us an object of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. O oh God of hosts, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. You removed a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground before it, and it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow, the cedars of God with its boughs. It was sending out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why have you broken down its hedges? So that all who pass that way pick its fruit and bore from the host and the forest eateth it away. And whatever moves in the field feeds on it. O God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine, even the shoot which your right hand has planted. 
and on the Son whom you have strengthened for yourself. It's burned with fire, it's cut down, they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the Son of Man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. O Lord God of hosts, restore us. Cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this music this morning. The ones that we sang earlier in this song that we just read. Father, would you use it to point us to Christ and to restore us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You perhaps have noticed as we read through this psalm, there were at least three different times we heard one phrase. Come or cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. You may also have noticed at least three pictures that we would come later on to recognize as pictures of Christ. One would be that of a shepherd. The second would be that of a vine. And the third would be the one called son of man. We're going to look at these three things this morning as we look through this psalm. But this psalm, while it is a song, begins and has as its nature that of a prayer. Look how it begins. We read this to open the service this morning as we read it again this morning. Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel. This song begins and is, in fact, a prayer. It's a cry out to God. It's a reminder that many of the songs that we sing, while they're proclaiming the nature of who God is, and while they are proclaiming His glory, they're also, many times, prayers. It's believed, though we cannot be sure, many, many, those, many biblical scholars will, will suggest that the setting for this psalm, and this is, by the way, not one of David's psalms, that the setting for this psalm is most likely the Assyrian invasion of, northern, of the northern ten tribes of Israel in 722 B.C. And this is a psalm perhaps likely written in response to seeing this invading country come in and just wipe out and leave as dust the northern ten tribes of Israel. And of course, the context of this prayer and the psalm fits nicely with that. You will see multiple spots where it talked about there between verses 8 and 18 and even before that, verses 4, 5, and 6, that the context is, Lord, we have been destroyed and in fact, he even, tells, he even says in his prayer, in verse 4, Lord, how long will you be angry with the prayers of your people? He says, you have made us an object of contention to our neighbors. And so as the psalmist is writing this song and this prayer, he's recognizing that all the disaster that's happening, perhaps from this invading army, is actually God's work. And he's confused and he's wondering why it's happening. And he's looking at all the things around him and seeing how bad things are. And he's seeing the death and he's seeing the destruction, and he's seeing the, the results of war, and he's going to the Lord, why would you do this to us? Why would you make us go through this? Maybe you've even asked the same question yourself. Have you ever had those moments in your life when you asked the Lord, why am I going through this? What did I do? Why is this happening? Well, not only is the Scripture full of those who ask the exact same question, I dare say that almost every one of us in this room has asked that question as well. Israel spent much of its history rebelling against God and much of its history crying out for, to God for help, for salvation, for rescue, for forgiveness. And this psalm is no different. Now, as we see this going on in the psalm, there are, again, three pictures that I think point to Christ in this. And the very first one we see in verse 1, O give ear, shepherd of Israel. Now, of course, he's praying to the Lord, to the Lord God there, but we recognize that in, in John chapter 10, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, doesn't he? Now, we recognize, we, we probably perhaps heard of that. We, we, we know that Jesus has said these things in John chapter 10. In fact, I want to, I want to even read it for you this morning. <clears throat> um, John 10 verse 11, Jesus says this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Now, we have probably heard any number of sermons on that. I'm sure most of them were, were worth listening to. But recognize to this, that when Jesus himself says, I am the good shepherd, he's, he's, he's saying more than just, 
I'm looking out for you. Jesus is saying more than just, I'm taking care of you. Jesus is saying more than he loves us. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he's making a claim to be the one that Israel is praying to in Psalm 80. He's making a declaration that he is, in fact, the shepherd of Israel. He's God. He's connecting these dots for us here. We just spent the better part of this last year in the book of Exodus. Now, I know some of you were probably at some point going, I'm tired of sermons on the temple or the tabernacle. I'm tired of all that stuff. And can we just get back to the New Testament? But let me, let me share with you, there's a reason we do that. Because the stuff in Exodus is actually really important. In fact, we miss truth that God has for us in the New Testament unless we understand the old. We have to know what happens in the Exodus. Jesus is the good shepherd. It's a great thing. I can learn all kinds of things about how Jesus loves me and wants to guide me, but I recognize there's something else when I realize that he is the shepherd of Israel, the God of Israel. And if I don't recognize the Old Testament, I may not realize all that he is saying there. Background matters. If I, if I said to you, may the force be with you. Now you laugh because you know where that's from, right? I'm guessing, is, has anybody here not seen Star Wars at least once? Ooh, a couple of you, wow. Mm, I didn't think that was anybody going to raise their hands there. Now, but you probably still know the context of that. Now imagine someone who's never heard of Star Wars and you say that phrase. Are they going to know what in the world you're talking about? Uh, what if I said, <laughs> uh, live long and prosper? Star Trek, okay, yeah. So some of you, if I did this, you might, you know. Again, if you've never seen Star Trek or don't know what a Vulcan is, you wouldn't have any idea what that means. Uh, this one might be a little bit more obscure if I just said the phrase, as you wish. Uh, Princess Bride, yes. Oh, fantastic movie. I'm trying really hard not to say that my name is Inigo Montoya right now. Um, now, again, if you don't like the movie or you don't know that movie, you wouldn't know what that means. When we don't know Exodus, when we don't know Genesis, when we don't know Psalms, there's a great deal of the New Testament we won't really fully understand or we only catch a glimpse of. So that's why we did Exodus. And, and even this evening, or this morning, when we see that the, they're praying to the Good Shepherd, and then we hear Jesus say, I am the shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. We recognize that he is saying he's the God of Israel. It's an it's a open, clearly seen statement once we know the Old Testament. And of course, shepherding includes presence and guidance and protection, just like God did for Israel in the, in the desert, in the wilderness, as he led them with that uh, pillar of fire. As he led them even in the tabernacle as his presence. You see there in verse 2, or verse, I'm sorry, verse 1, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. If you remember our conversations back in August on the Ark of the Covenant and the, and the, uh, and the mercy seat, that, that, uh, that the cherubim and that location that was considered to be the footstool and the throne of God, we recognize that the psalmist is making a reference to the tabernacle and to the Ark of the Covenant and to the way it was in the desert. In some ways, the author of this psalm is saying, God... Would you make it the way it used to be? <laughs> Have you ever said that? God, would you shepherd us like you did back in the old days? Would you make it like it was in the desert? Would you be with us in that pillar of fire? Would you lead us in that such a way? There is no greater sign of God as a shepherd, Jesus says there in John chapter 10, by the way, than him laying down his life for us. He also talked about in John 10 about him knowing his sheep and calling them out by name. Because he's here for Israel. There is so much. We, we could spend a whole sermon series on that, but we're just going to move on. He's, he's the shepherd here in Psalm 80. But on, beyond that, verses 8 to 18, you see this psalmist also talked about Israel as a nation, as a vine. He, he goes through their history, he says, 
you were, we were vine. We, we grew up in Egypt, so to speak, but you transplanted us. You took us up and you replanted us in our homeland. And there we flourished. There we grew. We became a mighty vine. And then he says, now you have destroyed us. You've knocked us down. The nations are mocking us. They're feeding upon us. We are destroyed. The, the, the vine is no longer flourishing. Now this is, a, again, you, this actually happens a couple times in the Old Testament where Israel itself as a nation is a vine that has been destroyed or is a vine that's rebellious, that won't produce the fruit that the vine dresser, God himself, has planted it and groomed it to do. Now, you might remember that not only is Israel the vine is so often in the Psalms, But who else says something about being the vine? Jesus himself did. Psalm 80 here, verse 12, the psalmist says to God, why have you broken us down? Why have you destroyed us? Why, why is so much calamity happening to us? And if we were to ask the question this morning for Israel, why did God allow Israel to be destroyed by Assyria and later on the southern tribes to be destroyed by Babylon? Well, we know the answer to that based upon the Old Testament, don't we? The answer is they were idolatrous, that the people of Israel were corrupt in their hearts. They constantly turned to false idols. And so God sent them prophet after prophet, warning after warning. He sent them things, he sent them men like Isaiah who said, listen, God has planted you, he has grown you, he has nurtured you. Why are you producing bad fruit? And he warned them about what was going to happen to them if they did not turn and become obedient to the Lord, to the covenant that they made as a nation. So we we can look at the questions of Psalm 80 and we kind of know the answer, at least in that context. So Israel is that vine, but they were also a faulty vine. They were a rebellious vine. They were a corrupt vine. And then in the Gospels, in John chapter 15, Jesus makes a remarkable statement. Again, we've heard this passage many times that we may not be catching all that is meant for it because there is a context here that we may not recognize. Jesus says in John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, so that it may bear more fruit. Verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He says the same thing over and over again there in John chapter 15. And Israel thought of itself as God's vine. And now here comes Jesus telling the disciples, no, I am the vine. Now what is Jesus trying to say to us? Where Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. The fruit that Israel failed to produce as a nation, as a people, Jesus did. There are a number of ways the Scripture kind of approaches this picture or this idea. We as a human race in general have fallen. We can go all the way back to Adam Adam, the original sinless man who did not stay that way because he chose to rebel and to sin. And so because of that, we are all now born sinners. We are all corrupted because of that. Israel is another demonstration of that, a people whom God made a covenant with, who God set aside to be holy, to accomplish something. And they constantly turned their back towards God and became a people who worshipped idols. Again, in Exodus we see this was at the very beginning. This wasn't something that just happened to Israel later on down the line. They are mere weeks away from having been liberated from Egypt. They find themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai. They have encountered the risen, uh, the, the, the living God thundering from the top of the mountain. And no more than days after that, they are doing what? Making an idol. And we can look at them and go, man, that's a sorry lot. But we can't do that unless we're willing to look in the mirror and say the exact same thing. The vine that God created Israel to be 
produced Christ, who is in fact the divine vine. And then when Jesus tells us that he is the vine and that we must do what? Abide in him. It's not just about being a good disciple. It's not just about God uh, or it's not just about Jesus empowering us to do good things. It's not just about living life the way we're supposed to as Christians. It is that life, that salvation, our existence comes because we are attached to the one true vine. Life comes from being attached to the vine. See, there's a whole context here to John 15, to John 10, that we don't get unless we are aware of Exodus and Genesis and Psalms. Jesus says in this Psalm, or just this, this, Jesus says in John 15, I am the vine. Another one of these Old Testament pictures. But also in this, there's another one. It's a little more subtle. In verse 17, the vine is in trouble. So the prayer is that God would rescue his vine. And in verse 17 of, John, of Psalm 80, he says, Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the Son of Man, whom you made strong for yourself. Now you may recognize that phrase, Son of Man. In fact, of all, the t- of all the ways Jesus described himself in the Gospels, the most common name he gave himself, the most common way he referred to himself is Son of Man. Now, we recognize that perhaps as coming from the book of Daniel. And there is in Daniel this, mess- this messianic figure called the Son of Man. But recognize even here in Psalms, we have this reference to a Son of Man being the one whom you will make strong, who will be an instrument of their rescue. Do we not see this? This Christmas song is referencing what we need. It's a prayer. It's a plea for God to save. It's Jesus saying, I am the vine. It's Jesus saying, I am the shepherd. It is Jesus saying, I am the son of man. I am your hope. The first candle that was lit this morning, was, we have multiple candles here, and the first one is called the candle of hope. Because as Psalm 80 is read and even sung, and while there's confusion and even some pain in the middle of that song, there is hope. There's a plea for the activity of God. Each week as we light one of these candles, and, and uh, when we do our Christmas Eve service, we'll have all the candles. that we, we will light a candle this week, the next week, the 17th, or the 24th. We'll get those four smaller candles lit, and then the, on Christmas Eve, we'll light that Christ candle in the middle. And the, each, the idea behind each candle is this, that the more candles are lit, the greater the light as we wait for the arrival of the light of the world. The hope that we have in this one who Psalm 80 is, even if it didn't know it was, referring to. So we have these three pictures. Shepherd, vine, son of man, all for the purpose of doing what? The thing that's also repeated three times in verse 3, cause your face to shine upon us, we will be saved. Verse 7, cause your face to shine upon us, we will be saved. Verse 19, cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Now the first time we see this phrase in Scripture, make your face shine upon us, is actually in Numbers. It's a blessing that God instructs Aaron and Moses to use over the people of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you and the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. You probably know that one. We also see hints of this in Exodus 33. You remember that moment? Israel, uh, Moses has been interceding. He's been pleading with God for Israel's rescue. And finally, as that conversation is winding down, Moses says, God, by the way, show me your glory. And the context of asking for Israel's rescue. And God says, of course, you can't see my face. His answer, Moses says, show me your glory. God says, you can't see my face and live. This idea of what what does it mean for Israel, for Moses, for even Psalm 80 here to ask God to make his face shine upon us? couple things 
first of all this. This is obviously a picture. It's, it's, a poetic, it's a poetic metaphor. What he's looking for is this. For God to look towards Israel and not turn his back. Maybe you know what it's like at some point in your life to have someone turn their back on you, whether it's physically or, or just as a symbol. What, what does it mean when someone turns their back on you? It means they reject you, right? It means they don't want to have anything to do with you. It means they're putting you out of, out of their life. And so the last thing we want is for someone to turn their back on us. And so what the plea here is, remember this psalm is talking about a perceived rejection by God. And so the plea is, oh, don't reject us. The plea is, make your face shine towards us. Lord, would you see us? Would you look at us? Would you, would you welcome us? Don't turn your back on us, God. But turn toward us. And then secondly, to turn toward us with a, a shining, welcoming idea. The truth is, too, someone can be looking at you, and then they can give you the look. How many of you have ever had your mom give you the look how many of you have given the look <laughs> yeah if there's if there's if there's one thing only slightly maybe not as bad as being you're having your back turned having someone turn their back on you it's when they turn at you they give you the look what the prayer here what the prayer here is lord don't turn your back on us but welcome us. Don't give us the look. But Lord, make your face shine. May there be a smile. May there be a welcome. You know, the, the parable of the prodigal son never uses this terminology, but I can't imagine it being any other way when that prodigal son returns home, expecting to have to talk his dad into at least letting him be out in the barn. And what the prodigal son gets as I think the Father's face shining upon him. He doesn't get a dad who turned his back to him. He doesn't even get a dad who gave him the look, I told you so. He gives him a, he gives him a, a hug and a come here and an embrace. Lord, make your face shine upon us and we will be saved. What Israel needs is the very presence, the very embrace of God. They need God with them. And that is this that is the psalm, that is this prayer. The salvation Israel cries out for, and there is a very real part of the psalm that's crying out for help from some invader from the from the people from the peoples, maybe Assyria as a nation around it. Israel is going, we're in trouble. They're coming with shoulders, they're coming with swords, they're coming with chariots, and we're dying. We need help. But ultimately, whether it was Israel in Exodus, Israel in Psalms, Israel in the New Testament, or us today, what we mostly need, need rescue from is not someone out there. It's from our own sin. Israel had been rescued out of Egypt, and yet they also, without the work of Moses as an intercessor, they needed, they needed rescue from God's wrath for their idolatry. Assyria, Egypt, these are secondary. Israel needs rescue from its own corruption. And by the way, so do we. We need God's rescue from our own sin. So as we read this psalm, we hear a plea for the salvation of God, for God's welcoming, shining face to come into our midst, to be our shepherd, to be the vine whom we get life from, and to be the son of man who rescues us through his work and rescues us mostly from our own sinful corruption through his welcome shining of his face. And when Jesus shows up in a manger, some thousand, some, if it's, written the 700, some 700 years later. It is an answer to the plea of what we now know can be a Christmas song. Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning for your work. 
and that you answered this prayer. Lord, we did not write this song. We did not even pray it uh, back then. But you answered it, and we have been the recipients of it. Lord, as we take some time perhaps this month to celebrate the holidays, to celebrate time to be together with family, to go to all these different busy things we perhaps have going on, may we stop and think over this song. And may our plea be the same as this 80th Psalm. Lord, would you be our shepherd? Would you make your face shine upon us? Lord, be with us. Welcome us. Redeem us. Save us. And then may we recognize that you've already answered that prayer through Christ, who is our shepherd and is the vine and is the Son of Man. And may we begin this next week overwhelmed by the answer to this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with us as Craig leads us in a time of worship. Maybe you need to this morning begin your, your December thanking the Lord for this answer to prayer. Maybe you need to get down on your knees and pray this song, this song, and plead for God's salvation this morning. If that's you, I want you to know that I would be thrilled to to kneel with you and pray that with you. So would Alan. There's any number of people in this room who would be glad to do that with you following the service. Whatever it is that God calls you to do, would you respond as we sing? Come thou long expected Jesus born to say thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art December's off to good start, isn't it? We have a wonderful God who has answered prayer, who does answer prayer. I would encourage you once again over these next few days to perhaps use this guide right here to pray for the work of the gospel and for those who are carrying it to the utter ends of the world and perhaps also to remember the Shore family specifically as well. A couple of other quick things this morning. For those of you who signed up and are buying gifts to the Joy Tree for children in London Elementary who need some help for Christmas this year. As you're buying those gifts, and by the way, those are due back, what, uh, 17th, thank you. <laughs> 17th, if you have, if you have get, signed up for that, I want to encourage you, go buy that Joy Tree uh, in front of the office before you leave this morning and grab one of these. This, this is a, a gospel presentation for kids, and inside it also is a little information card about the church. And would you include that or put that in the packaging you give out as you put those together so if you include this in your wrapping so if you if you signed up for that this morning 
or the or last couple of weeks, you got one of those gift cards that or you, get, you have a child you're sponsoring. Grab one of these so you can put it in the packaging and be a part of their Christmas gift as well. Uh, next Sunday, did you make sure to announce this? Next Sunday, following the morning worship service, uh, we will have a, a business meeting to approve the 2024 budget. So that'll be next uh, Sunday morning following the worship service. There are, in fact, some other things happening. I brought this so I wouldn't forget to do that. Here in two weeks, December 17th, we'll go caroling. We do this every, every, uh, we do this, uh, every, every December. We have a number of some of our folks who are shut-ins or just can't get out much, and we go caroling. So we will be uh, caravaning to different houses and singing that night and then coming back here for, uh, for hot chocolate and, and wassail and cookies and just snacks and just time of fellowship that night. So that'll be 5 o'clock here in two weeks on Sunday night. There is also a ladies' brunch on Saturday the 16th. And uh, that's for the ladies, right? That's, guys, you don't have to worry about that. That's just the ladies. And uh, there's a, it's an ornament exchange. So this sounds like a perfect thing for the ladies to do. On the 16th, there's information about that 1030 that Saturday morning, the 16th. Youth are having their Christmas party coming up. There's a, we have a Christmas schedule on Facebook, also on our website, just various activities coming up. All right. I think I got through all that. Our dismissal this morning will be out of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This will be our benediction this morning as soon as I get there. <laughs> Turn the wrong way. I didn't have it marked this morning. Here's, here's what happens. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all this week. Amen. We're dismissed.